Welcome to That's Good Sports. I am Brandon Perna, and with free agency right around the corner, I thought it would be a good time to revisit some of the worst quarterback contracts ever given. The kind that the organization regretted before the ink was even dry on the paper. Well, that may have just been Ryan Leaf, who audibly farted while signing his name, but you get the point. Which quarterbacks were given huge paydays only to make their billionaire owners weep with regret? That's today on That's Good Sports. Hey, if you like football news given to you by an idiot, subscribe here on YouTube and click that notification button so you know when I make videos. Today's episode is brought to you by manscaped.com slash good sports. Now Manscaped has been sponsoring this show for over two years now, which means my pubics have been on point for that long. My favorite product that Manscaped offers is the Performance Package Kit because it comes with everything you need to groom, which I now do simultaneously. The new Lawnmower 3.0 is the waterproof below the beer gut trimmer with skin safe technology to help you mow down those pubes. You also get the crop preserver ball deodorant, the weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer so you can clearly smell what you're hearing. And if you use my link below and code good sports right now, you'll get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs, which I'm wearing right now. I never chafe while shooting this show, Plus, you get 20% off and free international shipping from the company that's been supporting me longer than anyone. Jared Goff and Carson Wentz, this year we are learning a lot about quarterbacks and how their impact for their team on the field is pretty much paralleled by their impact on the team's financial situation. If your quarterback is great, you're happy to pay them whatever they're making. If they're not up to par or simply below average, that contract becomes the elephant in the room. And like that George Orwell story, you're gonna wanna grab a rifle and shoot that fucking elephant in the face. When discussing some of the worst quarterback contracts ever given, I do not want to account for unforeseen circumstances that made good contracts bad. For example, some people point to Mike Vick's 10-year, $137 million contract extension in 2004 as being bad. And while the Falcons weren't great in the two seasons following that signing, Vic was pretty damn good. His passing touchdowns increased each season. His picks stayed about the same. Passing yards and completion percentage consistent. And in 2006, he set the quarterback rushing record with 1,039 yards, which was just broken by Lamar Jackson in 2019, the year he won MVP. So I won't blame the Falcons for not knowing Vic was part of a dogfighting ring that would derail his career. Today is about quarterbacks who either regressed after getting paid or just never got any better, starting with Jared Goff. Jared Goff got a four-year, $134 million extension, which was signed with the Rams in 2019, not too long ago. Just imagine if Jared Goff throws this pass a half second earlier. The Rams might very well have won Super Bowl 53, and the narrative around him and Sean McVay's Rams would have forever changed. He didn't make that throw, but the Rams still paid him like a Super Bowl champion. When in fact, there's a huge difference between a guy that can get there and a guy that can win when seemingly the whole game plan wasn't working. Jared Goff is a Pro Bowl quarterback when things are going well and he's got all of the talent around him, but puts up three points in the Super Bowl when faced with a little adversity. That's why the Rams traded for Matthew Stafford, despite the four-year, $134 million they gave Goff. Because beating Goff really came down to beating McVay. And there will be occasions when the game plan just doesn't work. Then we've got the curious case of Joe is he elite Flacco. Flacco may be the greatest quarterback outlier in NFL history. The Ravens didn't just overpay him once, but twice. Fool me once, 
Shame on you. Fool me twice. We draft Lamar Jackson, you son of a bitch! Now the Ravens signed Joe Cool to a six-year, $120.6 million extension on March 4th, 2013. This was right after Joe led the Ravens to a Super Bowl victory over the 49ers in Super Bowl 47. The Ravens were a wildcard team that season, and Joe essentially had the best four-game stretch of his career in the postseason, throwing 11 touchdowns, zero picks, and averaging nine yards per attempt. He slayed the following dragons. Andrew Luck and the Colts, Peyton Manning and the Broncos, Tom Brady and the Patriots, and finally, Colin, I haven't even thought about my knee yet, Kaepernick. That forced the Ravens to make him the highest paid player in the league, even though he was just slightly above average for that entire season, and basically every season prior. For a team that had already won a Super Bowl with Trent Dilfer, Joe Flacco must have looked like a superstar. After that contract, Joe won exactly one playoff game and only got the Ravens into the postseason once. And to be fair to Joe, that was in 2014 where he had arguably his best season. After which though, he never threw for more than 20 touchdowns. And for some reason, that was good enough for the Ravens to give him another extension, 60 million in 2016. Two seasons later, they draft his replacement in Lamar Jackson and then trade him to Denver, who even more foolishly pays the final 20 million of that shitty contract. Now, if you're sitting in the front office and everyone is saying, fuck, well, I guess we have to pay this guy, then maybe you don't. Maybe you shouldn't. There's no rule that says you have to keep paying the guy who won you the Super Bowl. Hell, you were the only team that didn't do that. Then we've got Jay Cutler. January 2nd, 2014, he signs a seven year, $126.7 million extension with the Bears. That wasn't too long ago and reality TV has turned Cutler into a lovable character. But after signing that massive deal, Jay led the NFL in interceptions in 2014 with 18 picks. The second time he accomplished that feat with the Bears, although the 26th in 2009 was far more impressive. Chicago never won more than six games after making that massive deal and they released Jay Cutler in March of 2017 so he could retire in May and then sign a one-year deal to play in Miami. What have we learned from this deal? It's that you should never commit that much money to a nihilist like Jay Cutler, a man famous for not caring. You think he's gonna care more now that he never ever has to worry about money again in his life? Absolutely not. The last shred of competitive fire left Jay Cutler's body when everyone tore him to bits after not returning to the 2010 NFC Championship game with a sprained MCL. Just because Philip Rivers can play the position without moving his feet doesn't mean everyone else can. Now, I couldn't mention Jared Goff without Carson Wentz and his four-year $128 million deal that he signed with the Eagles also in 2019. Now it is extremely rare that a player can go from a late season injury during an MVP caliber season to statistically the worst full-time starting quarterback in the NFL in the span of just three years. It just never happens. Well, except for Peyton Manning, Cam Newton, maybe Kurt Warner. Maybe it happens a little bit, but usually it's father time or injuries rearing their ugly head and never as dramatically as it did with Wentz. 33 touchdowns to seven interceptions in 2017, where Tom Brady personally tears Wentz's ACL in order to secure another MVP, and Wentz is never the same. But you know what else was never the same? His supporting cast. Instead of throwing to guys like Alshon Jeffrey, Nelson Aguilar, prime Zach Ertz, with LaGarrette Blunt and Jay Ajayi in the backfield, he was mostly then throwing to guys like Greg Ward, Travis Fulgham, and an injured, aging Deshaun Jackson and handing off to Boston Scott most of the time the last two years. This is in addition to injuries on his offensive line. So Wentz developed a hero complex, which accounts for the turnovers, plus the injuries, plus a breakdown in simple throwing mechanics. You uh, also can't underplay Frank Reich leaving. Uh, just goes to show you the head coach isn't always the best coach on the team. And now we wait and see if the Colts can turn that bad contract into a steal. Then we've got Matt Flynn. Three years, 
27 million, signed with the Seahawks in 2012. Let me explain. Aaron Rodgers sits in the last week of the 2011 season. His backup, Matt Flynn, comes in against the Lions and throws for 480 yards and six touchdowns. For reference, here's a list of players who have never thrown six touchdowns in a game. John Elway, Johnny Unitas, Kurt Warner, and every other quarterback on this list. Although Flacco did throw five touchdowns in a game faster than any other quarterback in NFL history, doing it in the first 16 minutes and three seconds of the game against the Bucks in 2014. Back to Matt Flynn, whose lone six touchdown game was enough to convince the Seahawks to pay him 27 million over three years. And that didn't mean they weren't going to draft a rookie to sit behind Flynn and develop. And in 2012, the Seahawks took a 5'11 quarterback out of Wisconsin named Russell Wilson. Does that fire you up? And what happened when they put those two guys on the field? Russell Wilson beat the piss out of Matt Flynn in the preseason, playing so well that Seattle had no choice but to take the immediate L on the contract and start the rookie. We know what happened after that, but it's a lesson that just because you gave a bad contract, you don't have to be held hostage by that contract. It's something called the sunk cost fallacy, which is a fancy way of saying they cut their losses and it led to a lot of wins. All that is possible when you draft your franchise quarterback in the middle of the draft and have him on a rookie deal. Your biggest concern is then paying that guy later, only to learn he wants to be traded. Elvis Gerback. Five years, 30 million, signed with the Ravens in 2001. Great job for being on this list twice, Baltimore. And yes, the Ravens are the only team in NFL history that won a Super Bowl and the next offseason willingly got rid of the quarterback that won it for them. Trent Dilfer didn't win them the Super Bowl, but he didn't fuck it up either. Baltimore got tricked by Elvis Gerback's 2000 season where he threw 28 touchdowns and said, we're gonna upgrade and ended up paying him six million a year, which is more than quarterbacks like Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Jeff Garcia, Chad Pennington, Dante Culpepper, and Rich Gannon were making that year. Elvis fell back down to earth with 15 touchdowns and 18 interceptions, and he ended up retiring just a year into that five-year contract. It wasn't so much that they didn't need to upgrade at quarterback, it wasn't necessarily the wrong choice to move on from Dilfer. It's just that they chose the wrong guy in Elvis Gerback. Hell, they could have taken someone in the draft. You know who was taken at pick 32? Drew Brees. Where did the Ravens pick? 31. Fun fact about Elvis Gerback, he was People Magazine's sexiest athlete alive in 1998. Not because People Magazine thought he was the sexiest athlete alive, they actually thought Rich Gannon was the sexy one, but the only instruction they gave their photographer was to photograph the Chiefs quarterback. And so he thought it was Gerback and not Gannon. Side note, I don't remember the standard for male beauty back in 1998, but was Rich Gannon really the, the gold standard? The story seems to fall apart when when you know, you, you look at Rich Gannon. But it was confirmed by a People Magazine employee. And finally, one of the worst contracts goes to the Brockett launcher. Four years, 72 million for Brock Osweiler. All you really need to know about the Houston Texans in the Bill O'Brien era is that they signed Brock Osweiler sight unseen back in 2016. Obviously, they had seen him. He's hard to miss because he's freakishly tall and a pretty handsome man. Handsomer than, say, Rich Gannon, at least, with a no regrets tattoo. And what an ironic tattoo that was for Houston. They had just, you know, never met him in person. I'm not going to rewrite history and say Brock Osweiler wasn't good with the Broncos in 2015, because he was good with the poor offensive line and an inconsistent running game. And he won a few games where he was the main factor in the victory, but, he was never that good again. Once he got to Houston, the efficiency went down, 15 touchdowns to 16 picks, under 60% completions, and a disgusting 5.8 yards per attempt, which was 30th out of 30 qualifying quarterbacks that season. Somehow, that Houston team still made the playoffs, 
Brock actually had a winning record in fact, and they won a playoff game, albeit against Connor Cook and the Raiders, but a win nonetheless. Maybe if they had a better quarterback, they get past New England. But on the bright side, the Osweiler signing led to them trading up for Deshaun Watson, which led to, uh, well, this actually doesn't have a happy ending for Houston. I'm going to stop right here. Just like Peyton Manning stopped Brock Osweiler from ever getting any meaningful game reps. There you have it. Your worst quarterback contracts. Please subscribe here on YouTube. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, at Brandon Perna if you care to follow me in those places. Do you care to follow me in those places? What if I keep my bitching